Hey everyone, good to be with you today. I uh, wanted to continue what we were talking about last week about how to read the Bible and talking more about some practical ways that we can understand the Bible better. Because uh, as we know, the Bible can be tough to understand, right? Last week we talked about even even St. Peter said that St. Paul was confusing sometimes. Um, so if we wondered that, you know, how to interpret things, just remember that St. Peter found that. So uh, found that to be the case. But I'd like to continue to talk about how we can have hope to understand the Bible. Because what we have to remember is it's not that like God wrote the Bible with the goal of being confusing. And in, in fact, he's given us what we need in order to understand it. Um, and we mentioned a few steps that are key overall last week. Just pray about it beforehand. Ask people in the church any questions that you have. Or, um, and then last, make it something that you do daily so that you have practice, so that you're doing it better. Just like you get better at riding a bike by riding a bike. Read the Bible and you'll get better at it. Um, and then what we talked about last week specifically as a, a more practical tip is paying attention to what's called the genre of the passage. Um, because the correct interpret interpretation of a passage isn't necessarily what you would mean if you said those words. It's said within a certain literary style, and that helps us to understand what those words would mean. Um, usually we understand things according to the genre uh, when we look at them from a modern perspective, but not as easily with its ancient writings. But the next thing that I want to talk to you guys about is context. So um, in biblical interpretation, context is one of the most important factors that we can take a look at, if not the most important factor sometimes, um, other than just what the words themselves say. Um, context is all the stuff that I would say is around the passage, in a sense, that you're reading, and that the, the author assumes that you know. Sometimes those are like literally the words right before and right after or in that same book, um, but sometimes it's like the historical information or things like that that's around the passage and that people at that time would know. Um, and one thing to remember is like when we have an argument or disagreement with people, right, it's easy to take what they said out of context. Uh, a lot of times people take the worst sounding part of whatever someone else says and they ignore anything else that might make that sound better to win the argument. Fortunately for us, political ad makers would never do that. That would never be something that people do in politics, right? Um, and unfortunately, that's that's also something that people can do in the Bible, right? It's not always intentional. Um, though occasionally, people will take the Bible out of context for their own needs or to criticize the Bible. Um, but it's something that's easy to do even innocently or convenient to do. Um, one of the worst examples I've ever heard of someone doing this, though, was um, someone taking a, a verse out of Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, who was a woman who was thinking about a divorce and she and her husband with someone else. And there's a verse there that says, take up the new man. Um, the thing is, that verse is about becoming a new person that's redeemed by, by God, not divorcing your husband and taking on a new man. Um, so that's not what it means. In fact, a couple of verses before, if you read the context, says, you know, practice um, sexual purity. Uh, don't practice sexual immorality. But she decided that what God was saying to her was that she should just have a new husband. Um, I really think she probably just had a hardened heart, but this is an example of just what it means when you just completely ignore the context of what it meant to take up the new man. Or as a lot of translations say, take up the new self, um, not about another person. But first, I just want to, before we get into the context and how it all plays out, is um, is to list out the different kinds of contexts that there are. So number one, there's literary context, which is the context within that book itself. Number two is the biblical context. So what does it mean within the context of the whole Bible? And then the third one is historical or cultural context. So the literary context is just the things that are right around that verse, or at least in the same book that you're you're reading in or occasionally in books that are sort of split into two, like 1st and 2nd Samuel. It could be within like both of them. Okay, um, and what's sad is that sometimes people don't look at what comes right before or after. Like they can just take out the parts that they like and make them there. Occasionally it's like about a specific situation and we uh, the people will take it and make it apply to everything. Or there'll be like a word like all and they'll not realize that it's all of a certain group. So one example of a verse that people will get wrong is Philippians 4.13. 
people will say it all the time after like they win the Super Bowl or something like that. And they'll say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when they say it, it sounds like they think like, oh, God let me win the Super Bowl. And maybe because I'm more godly than the other team. I don't, I don't really know exactly why they think like God strengthened them but didn't strengthen the other team. But if we look at the context of Philippians 4, um, Paul is in prison and he writes this. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. He's saying, I can be content even in prison. And then he says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. What I think Paul is actually saying here is not like I can fly or I can win the Super Bowl because of Jesus. Uh, what he's saying is, no matter how bad things are for me, even in prison, I can get through it. I can do it. I can get through this situation, not just because I have enough food to eat, but because Christ is going to strengthen me even when I am poor and I have nothing. So if anyone's going to talk about Philippians 4.13 after a Super Bowl, it should be the losing team talking about, you know, I can get through this through Christ who strengthens me, this disappointment that I have. Or another one that people will take out of context all the time is Jeremiah 29, 11, which is, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, the verse before it says this, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. Now, a couple things. One, this is a God saying this to specific people. He's saying, look, my plans for you, Judah, are good. I'm going to help you out. Also, though, notice he says, when 70 years are done, I'm going to do this. Um, okay, like, that's, I guess, good news. Like, hey, you're only going to be exiled for 70 years. It'd be sort of like if um, a prophet were to come today and be like, hey, um, this is what God says to you, America. I know the plans I have for you. They're, they're good plans. Um, in 70 years, pandemic's going to be done. And we'd be like, that that's not really great news. That's not quite the news I was hoping for. I was hoping that you'd just, it'd be a, a week, a month. That's good news. 70 years, not great news. And that's actually what's going on here um, in that context. Even though uh, God is saying it's good news, and, and ultimately it is, that God's people are going to be redeemed and freed eventually, um, it might not have felt like good news at the time. And I think that that's something that we have to realize is that sometimes God's plans are good, but it doesn't feel like it. Um, and so one of the first things that I would encourage you to do is if you come across something in the Bible that seems confusing, is just read the stuff around it. See if there's maybe something more to it than it seems at first. Maybe words are being manipulated a little bit by the way that people are breaking up passages. Second one is, second kind of context, the biblical context, is just seeing how whatever you're reading fits into the Bible as a whole. So in some cases, that's um, seeing things in light of the big picture, and other times it's seeing things in tension. So an example of tension is some Bible passages talk about how we can't lose our salvation, and some warn us against losing our salvation, or at least so it seems when you first read it. So those are obviously not both true. Um, that we both can't and can lose our salvation. Um, but so what we have to do is, is read them in context of each other um, to some degree and see what the overall picture is and then figure out what the one, the other one means. In my opinion, the, the stronger argument is that we can't lose our salvation, but um, that's not really my main point. My point is that there's a number of things in the Bible that are in tension and we have to pay attention to those things when we, we see other passages. Um, but the second kind that we see is just, we always want to read it in context of the overall story of the Bible, right? The Bible has one long story of how, you know, God created the world good, Adam and Eve sinned, and then God wanted to redeem us as after we stopped reflecting God's glory, he wanted to redeem us and started by choosing Abraham. And from choosing Abraham, he wanted to bless the whole world. We see the nation of Israel being that chosen people supposed to bring that glory of God back to the world. 
And they fail over and over again until Jesus comes as the representative of Israel and the representative of us as people. He does it. He dies in our place, pays for all the sins, takes on all the curses of the covenant, rises from the dead, um, defeats sin, defeats death, defeats Satan, and now allows the Holy Spirit to come in and work in our hearts to redeem us. Um, and we know that one day he'll come back and set all things right. So when we read something like Paul's letters, for example, they're not part of that story. He's not really usually telling that story or adding to that story, but he's explaining that story and explaining how to live within that story. Or Psalms. A lot of times there'll be Psalms that don't tell that story, but they reflect the sadness over Israel's failures or the joy over God's future redemption, whatever it is that they're telling about. And that's important to see the relationship between the Psalms and what's going on in the story. Um, and the last kind that I want to talk about is historical or cultural context, which is one of the more broad forms of context and can be hard because with literary context, you just have to look at that book. Biblical context, you have to look at the whole Bible, which is a little bit harder, but eventually you can read the whole Bible. Historical and cultural context is just like anything that people would have known back in that day, right? Just like right now, we know that Trump is president and Biden is about to be president. Everyone knows that. Back in the day, they would have all known who the current king was or or whoever their political leaders are. And now we don't. Um, or maybe we know certain practices, like if I reference Lord of the Rings, many of you would understand, and there'd be some of you who don't. But back you know, then, they might have all understood some certain kinds of references. And if you don't understand those references, eh, you don't understand what's going on. Um, so sometimes with historical and cultural context, we can find it in the Bible. For example, a lot of the historical information is in the histories of like the kings and everything, and we can compare them to, say, the prophets um, and understand what's going on in the prophets because we know the history uh, behind it or something like that. Or with Paul's letters, sometimes we can look at the book of Acts and see what happened in that church, and then we understand that better. But other things aren't recorded in the Bible that are helpful for us to know. Like, for example, the city of Philippi, to whom the Philippians was written, was a military town that was really obsessed with honor. And then we look throughout the book, it, honor shows up a lot. And we see it in a new light once we understand how important that was to them. Or sometimes we might discover that the reason why the scripture bans something that maybe seems random is actually for an important cultural reason. For example, there are a bunch of verses in the New Testament that are like, don't have braided hair. Like, no, no, no. Definitely women, don't braid your hair. That's totally bad. And sometimes that would seem very weird to us because we're like, what's the deal with braiding hair? Like, I don't know why that's wrong. Um, and culturally, braiding hair was associated with prostitution. Um, and so you might think, understanding the culture that the real problem wasn't necessarily the braids it was what they were associated with and we might understand that okay in our culture it means like don't dress in a way that suggests you're a certain kind of woman a certain kind of immodest woman right that's what's the more important thing that kind of lasts throughout all time um, and that's the principle behind that commandment and the good news is that as you read the Bible more and more, and as you talk with other Christians, you'll understand even this historical and cultural context, the hardest kind to sometimes get. Um, and so when you come across something that seems strange to you and you've tried the other things, maybe try finding out, is there some sort of historical or cultural thing that I'm not getting? And maybe you'll find out why things are a little bit different than maybe you'd expect. Um, and so now what I want you guys to do is to maybe try some practice passages of figuring out the context um, so 1 John 5.15, read that, and then read the, con the literary context to figure it out. Isaiah 41-5, through 5. this one might be harder, but look at it in light of biblical context. If you can't figure it out on your own, try googling Isaiah 41-5 through 5 in the New Testament and see what happens and see if it is able to guide you. And then the third one I want you to try is Romans 12.1-2. Um, and that talks about living sacrifices. Um, I want you to like just Google what is what were sacrifices in the Roman world and in the Jewish world, um, because those it was written to the Romans, but a lot of those Romans were Jewish, um, and so that's kind of the cultural background there. So um, go ahead, and those are kind of your assignments of things to think about and apply this to. Um, so look forward to talking to you guys. Talk to you later. Bye.